Okay. 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 Uh, welcome everybody. Uh, welcome uh, everybody. My name is Marko Lukasukčić. I would like Mark to Lukasukčić. welcome you uh, in the name of the University, University of the Eka and Center for Advanced Out of Europe. Out of Europe. Marko Luka. Marko Luka. Yes. yes. Maybe my sound Maybe is better. better. Are we? Are we duplicating the sound or are we? Hmm? Yeah, there is hmm? echo all the time. Somebody needs Somebody to needs, uh, put uh, out headphones or mute. <laughs> Are we better? Are we better? You should mute everyone automatically who's not mm -hmm. presenting. Okay. Okay, here we are, now it's working. So apologies for another set of technical difficulties. This seems to be the, <laughs> the sort of a, uh, that's okay. It's good to, to encounter technical difficulties. They sort of remind us that of the nature of technology. So I would like to welcome you again, everybody uh, to CAS uh, seminar with Eagle and Whale. Uh, in, on the name of uh, University of Rijeka and Center for Advanced Studies Southeast Europe. Uh, Glenn Whale is a founder and chair of Radical Exchange Foundation that was founded following the publication of Radical Markets, Up Uprooting Capitalism and Democracy for a Just Society, which Glenn wrote with Eric Posner. He is a political economist and social technologist at Microsoft's Office for uh, Office of Chief Technology Officer. He is a researcher in a variety of fields, which predominantly have to do with political economy and uh, social technology. And we are very, very happy to uh, have Glenn with us today. Welcome, and I would leave the floor to Glenn. Uh, it's an honor to be here, and I'm uh, sorry that having a technology executive didn't improve your technical experience. Uh, I often have to make that apology. I also want to upfront um, tell you that this is a presentation very much in progress. It's something I'm preparing to give as the annual lecture for the uh, one of the parties in the Netherlands, the D66 party, which is sort of a green liberal party. and. Um, as such, you may see more references to the Netherlands than you expect, and I'm not entirely sure how long this goes, so hopefully we'll have lots of time for questions, but feel free to interrupt throughout. So um, I think that COVID-19 has really reminded us of how interdependent uh, we all are in a way that capitalism uh, typically sort of runs counter to. Um, you think about New York City and all the private property magnates there who've amassed enormous wealth. And uh, then you see how the failing of basic public health infrastructure shut that whole city down and in fact caused property values there to collapse uh, dramatically uh, by about 50%. Um, and on the other hand, in other societies like Taiwan, uh, where there has been greater investment in those collective goods, saw almost no economic effects of the crisis. So I think we really came to see that all the things we usually um, attribute to private wealth depend extremely fragilely on a bunch of social infrastructure, which is often ignored and neglected uh, in the context of capitalism. And I think that that, um, in the words of Ernest Hemingway, uh, you know, he said that uh, the way that you go bankrupt is first gradually and then abruptly. And I think we're seeing that with confidence in capitalism within the West and especially the United States. Over the last decade, we've seen a gradual erosion, especially among the young generation, Generation Z or Zoomers, as they're now called, um, who you know, used to a decade ago support uh, capitalism significantly over socialism and now are pretty close to equal. Um, but that was a sort of gradual erosion. We've seen a much more abrupt loss of confidence during the crisis. Um, with overwhelming majorities of Americans saying that current forms of capitalism are insufficient to ensure the greater good of society 
to produce the kind of society we want for the next generation or to work for the average American. And of course, America is one of the most capitalist supporting societies in the world. Now, um, I think that this loss of confidence in capitalism is actually uh, quite well merited. Um, and the reason is that the actual um, circumstances in which the theory of capitalism, the sorts of things that are the basis of so-called neoliberal economics, the thinking of Milton Friedman, et cetera, are based, simply don't apply to most of the scenarios that we're interested in the real world. So if you look in neoclassical economic theory, um, the you know, traditional idea is a, a situation of what's called decreasing returns. This is the idea that um, the more of uh, people or inputs that you use into some production process, the less marginal value you get out of the additional input. And the you know, classic story here is that if you have a factory with a certain number of machines and you keep adding workers, um, eventually the machines get crowded and the last worker adds less than the workers before them did. And in a situation of decreasing returns, in capitalism to have efficiency, you have to pay everyone the amount of incremental uh, uh, goods that they produce. Um, and under decreasing returns, if you do that, you'll still have a profit left over because the average production of people because of decreased returns will be greater than their marginal pro product. And if you pay people that marginal product, you'll get to keep the differences in an average product. On the left, you see a little graph illustrating this. Um, here's a case of diminishing returns, whereas you increase inputs, outputs increase at a diminishing rate. If you produce at this point where we've drawn the tangent line here, um, then what you have to pay people consumes resources from the top to this little profit bit here. And then below that uh, profit bit, all that is the money that you earn because uh, you only need to pay people this marginal product, which is less uh, per person than the amount that you've accumulated. Um, so that's, that's really the scope of the standard theory of markets and why markets uh, work. Um, but in fact, uh, the much more common situation, the much more relevant situation is one of increasing returns. What is increasing returns? This is a case where the more that you, uh, more people you add, the greater is the uh, marginal productivity of people. In that case, again, if we draw the tangent line and you pay people their marginal product, you have to pay more than everything that you produce because the marginal product is above the average product and therefore you'll make a loss. And that makes capitalist profit inconsistent with the efficiency that capitalism premises itself on. Um, and, you know, why do I say that increasing return situations are more uh, relevant? Well, the fundamental um, idea of increasing returns is that the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, that we can all achieve more together than we could in total in our separate and individual capacities. But if that weren't the common or even overwhelmingly common situation in human life, we would all live in isolated huts. The whole concept of civilization, everything that political economy is actually trying to study is a phenomenon of increasing return. There, there, and everything that capitalism takes credit for is a function of increasing returns. And with these increasing returns, it's not just a theoretical problem that capitalism doesn't work. In, in fact, we see this in practice all the time. So if you think about the internet, a famous property of digital goods is that they have diminishing marginal costs. Why is that? If you supply software to many, many people, it costs much less per person than if you supply it to just a few well, basically, once you've created it, it's more or less free to distribute it to more people. And if you just charge the marginal price, which would be the efficient thing to do, then you wouldn't be able to make a profit. You would make a loss. You wouldn't be able to fund that development. So we're forced within the digital world into a very clear choice between basically either having monopolies like a lot of people thought my, my employer Microsoft was in the 1990s, or not charging for things, charging very low for things like they do in the open source community, 
and then ending up with dramatic underfunding of the services that we need to support all of our lives. So this is a little image of uh, a, you know, starving programmer um, who's begging in the streets, uh, despite being one of the people who builds one of the protocols that underlies a lot of internet security because it's all done in an open source way where the person can earn nothing. So software is like a perfect prototype of the failures of capitalism, but it's not the first or the only or even the main uh, example of what happens with increasing returns. In fact, all of the things that we associate with modernity, all of the things that capitalism claims credit for are increasing returns phenomenon. Um, the word citizen and bourgeois that are so associated with um, capitalism relate to saying that someone lives in a city. But cities are the ultimate increasing return phenomena. They come into existence because people together can achieve more than they can separately, and they depend crucially on sanitation from the very beginning of cities. That's what allowed cities to exist and to emerge out of the Middle Ages was improvements in sanitation. And we've seen that cities collapse in the absence of sanitation in public health. So cities, the core phenomenon of modern capitalism are increasing return phenomena that capitalism can't account for. Industrialization, gathering many people into one place to produce something is the classic increasing returns phenomenon. What's the next industrial revolution? Electrification, invented by you know, uh, Benjamin Franklin in the 18th century and accomplished almost nothing until it was rolled out into power grids by public action in the early part of the 20th century. And the internet, as I mentioned, is the ultimate increasing returns good where everything is based on network effects and people's ability to work together online. So modernity, the very thing that capitalism puts at the core of its argument is an increasing returns phenomenon. And in fact, almost all of the main problems that we're facing today come from the inability of capitalism to cope with these increasing returns phenomena. From the fact that you're basically trying to run an increasing returns program on the decreasing returns computer of capitalism and you keep getting sort of compiler errors. Compiler error, a few big tech companies control the whole world. Compiler error, the world is burning uh, because we can't coordinate action on climate change. Compiler error, the quality of information that we're getting is awful because capitalism has no model for providing quality information. Compiler error, oh wait, capitalism can't work unless people are actually safe to move about and transact with each other, which they can't be if there's a virus spreading like crazy. Um, so at its core, capitalism is a contradiction. Capitalism is built on this model of increasing marginal costs, supply and demand, blah, blah, blah. And yet if you actually look at everything that is attributed to capitalism and that it's given credit for, it's an increasing return phenomenon, which, cap, which is completely inconsistent with the thing on the left. Literally, these are all the major inventions that a book in favor of capitalism talks about. The printing press, ultimate information good. Telephone, network good. Microprocessor, software good. Windows, software platform. I mean, it's literally, there, there's nothing that capitalism views as core to its ideology in terms of its actual historical successes that's consistent with the underlying theory. Um, and yet, the populist alternative uh, that's held up of the nation state, whether on the left where it's more about the state or on the right where it's more about the nation, is all equally incapable of dealing with these phenomena. Why is that? Every one of these advances that I talked about fundamentally change the geographic and social contours of the nature of people's interactions. The printing press completely reshaped the nature of states and so forth in Europe by changing the patterns of religion and belief. Um, the uh, internet allowed for all sorts of different communities to emerge. And the nation state 
has pretty much for 200 years been around the same fixed boundaries with very limited migration, with majorities often oppressing minorities that are important emergent groups, you know, and polities within it, and denying the cross-cutting international nature and international and cross-national nature of the collaborations that are necessary. So the state is far too rigid to be consistent with these patterns that we need to see. And yet capitalism is also completely inconsistent with them. Um, and in fact, like we see the problems of the state just as sharply as we see the problems of capitalism. What do I mean by that? Um, we have this world that's fragmented into all these nation states, and yet our environmental problems are fundamentally both international, cross-national, and international. If you think about the problem of the Amazon River, this is of sacred and historical importance to a small minority of the population of five different countries, with people who have lived along that river for thousands of years. Um, and yet the, the nations that they live within oppress them and undermine the river. And at the same time, they're in conflict with each other in the same way that individuals are in conflict with each other within a capitalist society. So that just doesn't work. The, the, the river is a classic example of uh, how the nation state is not the answer to these public good problems. Uh, another example is that, you know, you could say, well, let's go to a more local area, let's go to the city. But of course, within cities, you always have minorities. And those minorities are often oppressed by the cities that they live in, but yet find solidarity with minorities in other places. So trying to draw these fixed historical boundaries does not actually allow us to achieve the kind of coordination that we need to, to overcome the difficulties of capitalism. Radical exchange is, is basically a movement that's trying to move beyond capitalism uh, and statism, beyond the opposition between individualism and collectiv collectivism, and to, based on these principles, form a new vision of uh, the world that uh, we seek. I'll read off the principles, but then I want to get into some concrete examples of, of how this might work. So we oppose both the extremes of isolation and totalitarianism and actually see them as very related to each other, and instead favor emergent and responsive social organization an alignment between innovation in physical technology and the social technology that governs it. Equilibrium between individuals and communities so that communities are viewed as growing out of individuals, but individuals are, are viewed as the confluence of communities uh, in equal measure. We favor equal but flexible voice and vote. So rather than rigid one person, one vote, rigid polity, we, we favor uh, emergent and flexible use of uh, democratic power. Uh, we favor, rather than private property or globally collective property, diversely shared ownership patterns that reflect the diverse nature of the social interactions we have. We support democratizing capitalism and corporations, but blurring the lines of the state at the same time. We support subsidiarity beyond geography. That is, we believe in some form of a federal structure, but that it's not that the only such federal structure is geographic. It could be within different social groups. We support diverse forms of pluralism. Um, we believe in social plasticity, that we need to adapt our social institutions to the ways in which social life is itself changing. That we can't separate economics and politics, uh, that they're not two spheres, but that they're most effective when they're deeply interconnected with each other uh, as political economy. We favor the erosion of existing forms of oppression and the um, taming of them uh, rather than their violent overthrow, building alternatives within while constraining the power of the strongest elements to allow that to happen rather than uh, uh, revolution as it's usually conceived. Um, we believe in leveraging the elements of the system and actually collaborating with a variety of powerful elements to contain and replace it. Um, and living the principles that we um, 
uh, developed here uh, in our lives. Okay, so let me try to give some uh, quick illustrations of uh, so some of the more concrete or sort of formal mathematical elements that go into this. So the first is an idea called quadratic finance, and it's an alternative to either capitalism or the nation state as a way of um, organizing things. And the basic idea of quadratic finance is that um, individuals make contributions to creating some type of an organization, but either a philanthropist or a state matches those contributions, but in a very specific way, where um, mathematically, the amount received by the organization is the square of the sum of the square roots contributed. Uh, but the way to think about this is that matching systems, um, for example, the campaign finance matching system in the uh, city of New York, tend to match more small contributions than they do large contributions. Sometimes they have a cap or sometimes, you know, the match gets smaller or something like that. Um, and they tend to match contributions to a candidate with more donors uh, than less. So in, in the state of New York, you get matched six for one up to $100 uh, as long as the pe person has 999 other contributors. Um, quadratic finance takes that idea, but actually develops it into a mathematical formula for optimal public goods uh, funding, um, according to standard economic theory. And this idea is now being used, uh, I, I developed it, by the way, with Vitalik Buterin, who's the founder of the Ethereum blockchain, and Zoe Hitzig, who is a poet and economist at Harvard. Um, and it's now being used in the Netherlands to fund media. It's being used in um, uh, the Ethereum blockchain to support open source software. Um, I won't get too much into the logic of exactly how this works, but it's basically based on the notion of Immanuel Kant's uh, categorical imperative. He said that we should all act as if um, our actions were a universal maxim for all people. But a problem for that is it relates to like if everyone else was in a parallel situation to yours. But in a setting of social diversity, people are not in perfectly parallel situations. They're in imperfectly parallel situations. So if, if, I'm, if, if some issue is a bit important to me, but not dramatically important to me, I need to magnify how much I care about it by more than someone to whom it's very important. Right, because um, if I want to be Kantian. And that's exactly what quadratic funding does. The smaller part you are contributing to something, the more match that your funding receives. Um, some properties of this are that the value created scales as the square of the number of people contributing, uh, but only linearly in an increase in the money that's contributed. Now, there are some big challenges uh, with this. It's still a very individualistic notion because you have basically the sum of these individual contribution square roots. And there's a real question of like, for example, are me and my wife two separate people who are in this sort of public goods problem with each other? Or are we the same person given that we consume most things together? And eventually I think we need to move beyond this to some more social notion of people's identity that then allows us to overcome conflicts across people that uh, arise because of their social differences rather than just, um, you know, individual self-interest. Uh, but I think it's an important step in the right direction. Now, of course, you might ask, how do you fund this? How do you get these funds to do the, the matching? And there's a uh, very uh, deep principle in economic theory uh, that speaks to this. And let me give a simple illustration. So it, it's famous. I don't, I don't know if this is true in, in, um, in Grotia, but I assume it is that um, if you have a really good school in a town, the property prices tend to be high because people want to send their children to that school, right? Um, and um, that is a, a general result that if you create some public good, the value that it throws off, which can't be captured by that public good itself, as we were talking about before, ends up getting absorbed by the profit-making, congestible, decreasing returns activities, in this case, land. Um, so the money doesn't disappear. It basically, if you sort of are throwing off more value from increasing returns than you can capture, that's being absorbed by the profits somewhere else in the system. That's called the Henry George theorem. 
And if you tax those things, you always have enough money to provide for these increasing returns activities. And in fact, I think the essence of social policy is to tax those profits that accumulate and use them to fund those public goods that create them in the first place. Um, and a very clever idea for this uh, was sort of evolved over the course of the 20th century, uh, but has very deep roots in ancient Athens, uh, in the practices of Danish kings in the 17th century, and in Jewish law. Um, and it's well expressed uh, by Arnold Harberger, who is a, one of the great economists, who said, if you have to make a base for taxes, adopt criteria that determine the true economic value. The solution the economist offers is simple and direct. Allow the owner to declare the value himself, make the values public, and oblige the owner to sell his property to any person willing to pay the declared value. The sy system is simple and creates incentives even beyond those existing in the market um, for assets to be employed in their most productive economic use. So this is a very bold form of a wealth tax, which um, actually accelerates the dynamism of a marketplace rather than reducing it. Uh, and it was first really uh, put forward in, in its modern form by Sun Yat-sen, the founder of the Chinese revolution, uh, and incorporated into Taiwan and, and more recently uh, into practices in Estonia. So let me just give an illustration of this um, from a uh, artist depiction of the radio spectrum, uh, supposing we were to apply it to uh, control over different parts of the radio spectrum. So this is a visual depiction of, of radio bands across space and, and the radio spectrum in uh, uh, an area of the United States. Um, and uh, currently lots of radio stations and television stations uh, control these. Um, on, under this system, rather than just controlling them and owning them and being able to keep them away, they'd have to put a price on it. So let's say Q91.5, a radio station, controls uh, this pink area here um, and puts a price of $20 million on it. Now, a problem is that uh, these days, not that many people really listen to the radio or watch television. So we might want to repurpose this for something else, for um, a more innovative use. Now, uh, if uh, under the system, the Q91.5 could change its price at any time, it could raise it to 30 million, but it would have to pay a tax, let's say 7% annual tax, on the price uh, that on average it has assessed over the year. So if it had put for six months, 20 million, for six months, 30 million, um, it would have uh, one and three quarter million uh, tax available. But from the perspective of repurposing things, the real value is that there would be a price on all the spectrum. So imagine you need to repurpose something and get a nice contiguous block of spectrum. You're at, say, Verizon coming in. You then could just go in on an app circle some area and it would tell you the price that you'd have to pay, which here would be $82.3 million, much cheaper than getting a rectangular block over here, which would be more like $200 million. And then once you do, you could package together this bit that you actually need, put a high price on it so, so no one would take it, and then take the part you don't need and put it back on the market. Now, that, this is a very bold vision. Um, and I think a lot of people have discomforts with imagining property being as fluid as this. Um, but there are lots of steps we can take towards these things, even as we experiment with these very bold visions, that are more incremental. And I think one of the most exciting of these, uh, and there are many, is the idea of harnessing competition policy and antitrust to create radical new international democracies. How is that? Well, a lot of people think, especially in academia, that corporations are this horrible, you know, profit-seeking, uh, behemoths. But you know, one real advantage of corporations is they genuinely do have an international set of people that they serve. And if you were able to force or use rules to make those powerful corporations democratically accountable to an emergent polity, to the people that they serve, you would actually create a powerful democracy that crosses boundaries and that allows us to do things that, that we can never do with the nation state. So one thing that I'm working on 
quite a bit is the idea of actually using antitrust laws. Uh, a, a remedy in antitrust laws could be the actual transformation of the corporation, at least partially, into a democ democracy accountable to the people that it serves. And that's a vision that's very much supported by the leading experts in corporate governance, people like Colin Meyer, uh, and I'm working on this idea with Michelle Meager over here. Um, but that's just a few of the ideas that we work on. Um, we work on uh, something called quadratic voting, which is related to quadratic finance, a way of reimagining voting. We work on new approaches to migration based on communities rather than purely on nation states. We, we work on uh, radical transformations of the corporate landscape using antitrust. We work on new ways of conceiving of identity through new data structures that will allow us to um, get past the nation state or, other, or some very centralized entity to control uh, how we represent ourselves. We work on new ways to do democratic deliberation using statistics and clustering in uh, what's often called artificial intelligence. And we work on new structures for the control uh, and bargaining over data, uh, data collaboratives or data cooperatives um, that could uh, help people gain more agency in, in how their data is used by collective organization. Um, and as radical as these ideas might sound, they're very much playing out uh, in a whole range of areas in the real world, from uh, the way that Taiwan has organized its um, uh, digital democracy um, and a system that was the most effective in the world at responding to COVID. Um, the way that Colorado, the state of Colorado is funding its uh, uh, budget, deciding on its budget and on, on its executive priorities. Um, the way that uh, the Ethereum community is funding open source software. Um, and we have more than 100 local groups around the world that are building these out in collaboration with a wide range of uh, local actors. But Taiwan, I think, is really the most exciting example. Uh, this is a country where, um, you know, even though they're only, uh, their democracy is actually, I think, younger than most of the Eastern European democracies, um, they've managed to build the most vibrant digital democracy in the world, coming out of their version of the Occupy movement, something called the Sunflower Movement. Um, their digital minister, Audrey Tang, and the GovZero movement that she's involved in has built this new way of delivering digital services to people that's not controlled either by corporations, uh, you know, profit-seeking corporations or by the government, but instead by um, these collective groups of civil society actors that hack things together um, and then use their access to data that they get uh, from their communities to bargain with corporations and the government for services that they need. And they've put this together with the use of quadratic voting to actually highlight the projects that are most important to people and that deserve public funding. And then they don't actually have any official policy of giving funding to these, but there's so much legitimacy in the platform that local officials feel that they need to go along with things that scored well. They also have found ways to deliberate at large scale um, on uh, policy and collective decision making using basically a new form of civic media, which is this thing called polis, where they use AI to cluster together um, the views of different people. And then people are able to sort of compete to come up with the views that most bring people together across those boundaries. Uh, to help form a, a loose consensus. Uh, Estonia has also been a real leader in this direction, uh, both in terms of their digital democracy and the way that they've used land taxation, as we described, to uh, make a much more dynamic uh, uh, city. Colorado uh, in the United States has shown, um, uh, both through using uh, quadratic voting in their executive decisions and in their legislature, but also to fund uh, aid for uh, through quadratic finance for the downtown areas that have been so hard hit by the COVID uh, pandemic. Um, and perhaps unsurprisingly, Estonia and Taiwan 
were the leaders in their response to COVID. They had the smallest economic uh, negative consequences and the fewest deaths within their uh, relevant regions. Now, I think it's so important that we hold up these examples in this hope because uh, otherwise the failure in general of the West, the huge number of lives lost and the economic devastation that people are feeling is going to redound to the benefit of the largest country that did better in addressing the pandemic, uh, China, um, and their narrative of bureaucratic authoritarianism uh, as the solution. I think we can no longer rest on our laurels and be conservative and assume that we've found the right systems within the West if we want a chance of, of, of preserving pluralism, because there's gonna be a crisis of legitimacy, you know, not just around capitalism, but more broadly with, around liberal democratic social systems, which have so failed to uh, protect our people. And Silicon Valley is very ready to bring that to the West, uh, to bring the surveillance uh, state via uh, surveillance capitalism. And you see even many on the left supporting this, talking about you know, fully automated luxury communism, where some artificial intelligence will just take control and offer us all of the things uh, that we want. So I hope that you'll join with us. I hope that you'll help us um, tell stories about this and, and reimagine uh, the way that we live. Um, and we're doing that with filmmakers like Boots Riley, with art galleries, um, the uh, best-selling strategy game of all time, uh, Civilization VI and its late, latest iteration, incorporated a bunch of radical exchange ideas. Um, and we're doing it in the way that we uh, live our lives. Um, we're, we're playing the games around this stuff. We're building them into our community. We're talking to each other about them and using them to fund um, uh, the, the activities we do together. Uh, and uh, eventually I hope you'll help us lead and, and work together with political parties uh, around the world from uh, Bogota, Colombia, where we work with the mayor, to Canada, um, uh, the United States, the Netherlands, uh, Taiwan. Together, I think we can build a global movement uh, across the political center that acknowledges the flaws of uh, both the, the nation state and capitalism and it proposes new innovative alternatives that blur the lines uh, between the two. Thank you so much and I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you very much, Glenn, for this extraordinary presentation. Uh, now is the time for questions. But since there is a lot of people, I would just uh, suggest if it were possible, since I'm not sure I could see all the hands, could you please uh, either raise your virtual hand or write in the chat that you'd like to ask a question? Uh, before this takes place, uh, I would like to uh, start off just by asking you, Glenn, uh, first of all, just the first sort of question. Since we're at this moment uh, sort of developing the idea, the project that would uh, essentially test uh, the Taiwan model on uh, the scale of, presumably on the scale of university and perhaps some other universities and test which sort of variants of certain stages would work better. One of the questions that uh, I would like to ask you that is somehow related to this is this idea of subsidiarity without geography. So if you could yeah. just expand a bit on, on this. If, if well, well, I think the basic principle is that, um, you know, look, many people believe in subsidiarity or federalism or whatever you want to call it, the notion that we have many layers of governance. Um, but most people believe that that has to be geographically based. And there's a, a big mistake in making subsidiarity exclusively geographically based. The classic example is that, you know, in the United States, for example, um, there are, in most areas, African Americans and Latinos are minorities. Um, and so if you have a purely geographic subsidiarity, they end up being oppressed by the local majorities in all of the areas. 
the subsidiarity by purely geographic terms doesn't work. Another example of this that Audrey Tang uses a lot is that um, you know uh, she's transgender, um, and when she was 13 years old, she had the um, testosterone level of roughly an 85-year-old man. So she was sort of 20, 25 percent, uh, you know, female, 75 percent male by the standard metrics. And then she also went through female puberty in her 20s when she transitioned. And uh, in Taiwan, there are very, very, very few people like this. But by interacting with the global uh, community, she found a large number of people who were transgender. So we need to learn to give governance to communities that are not purely geographically based, or, or even if they are geographically based, maybe cut across the geographies that we usually line up. So many of our geographies are based on language rather than topography, right? Um, and uh, we, we, you know, Europe is sliced up in all sorts of ways by language. Africa is sliced up in all sorts of ways by colonialists, right? So, so it's just drawing lines within existing nation states cannot allow us to get the sort of organization we can. So what, what can we do instead? We can have things like quadratic funding, which allow new emergent organizations to rise up that are not purely based on a profit principle, but have legitimacy that's created by some type of a, a mechanism. And eventually we can get funding for that across borders. And I'd eventually like to see that when we, you know, after COVID stitch back together the global international trade and travel system, that we do so not on purely capitalistic lines, not on lines that are just based on, you know, quote, free trade, unquote, but that recognize that there are enormous numbers of international public goods that we need to support. And that the solution to the problem of, say, government subsidizing some company, which is good because it allows you to move away from capitalism. You can't just have purely capitalistic funding of things. What's called subsidies are just any deviation from a capitalistic model. But the problem is not that, say, national governments are doing that. that that's a benefit. The problem is that we don't have that across countries. Um, and so if we can build up a form of international cooperation, which is based on actually spreading uh, non-capitalistic modes across international cooperation rather than tearing them down within nations, um, that uh, I, I think is, is very promising. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do we perhaps have some other questions? Ah, Gazella, yes, please. Well, actually, um, ah. it's more, can you hear, hear me? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's more of thinking while I was listening to you, I was thinking about something else, which is not, I would say it's not directly linked to capitalist uh, structure and uh, everything which you were explaining, and, but something else, which uh, uh, I was reading yesterday, actually one article from one of my colleagues who is Hungarian and who was explaining about uh, how technology today is used by uh, Viktor Orban uh, mm -hmm. in Hungary in order to make, uh, in a way, national transnational community of Hungarians and uh, preserve their uh, 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 keep the borders with technology basically some virtual borders of the nation in spite of all these uh, efforts to uh, use technology for more democratization uh, which we are like, somehow we are always thinking about uh, technology can be used for uh, greater access greater participation involving people uh, different people but here i was listening i was reading actually about the case where you are using technology and all these new forms of uh, making online communities for some completely other goal which is actually exclusion not in inclusion so i was just thinking uh, uh, when you were talking about this, what is your experience and from the experience of your organization, uh, what do you think about such uh, approach and uh, how basically this is something completely, I would say, uh, opposite to what you want to achieve and how do you think yeah. about it? Well, so the first thing to say is, so one, one uh, quote I use very often is that Einstein once said, um, 
if our means of social organization had advanced as much as our tools had, we would have um, happy and carefree lives. But as it is, we've put razor blades into the hands of three-year-old children. And I think that uh, you know, a fundamental principle is that we need to have our ways of imagining our social life and organizing our social lives advance at the same pace as our technologies do. Technologies without an advance in that social imagination can uh, just empower a more complete form of bureaucratic authoritarianism or totalitarianism. And you know, Orban's an example, but you know, China is perhaps an even more sharp mm -hmm. example, right? Um, and so uh, I think the, the fundamental problem we've run into is that we live in a society, and again, this, this comes back to the contradictions of capitalism, where we talk about how we need to preserve capitalism in order to allow for the dynamism of technology, which is such a contradiction in terms because capitalism itself is a technology uh, that needs to evolve along with the changes that allegedly it enables when in fact it, it actually is a drag on the ability of those things to emerge. So um, to me, the critical thing is that we cannot separate technological evolution from the social evolution that has to accompany it. And uh, we need to talk about those things in parallel. You know, I actually in some ways have a respect for a true conservative. A true conservative opposes technological evolution and opposes uh, uh, social evolution. At least that keeps those things in parallel. Uh, what we need to do is understand that if we are going to advance, and I think we have to if we want to compete uh, with authoritarian models like China, then we need to understand that there has to be just as much change in our social organization as there is in our, uh, um, in our technologies. Thank you. Thank you, Gwen. Uh, I'd like to ask on something. Yes. Uh, so uh, you've shown that your system is broadly construed com compatible with the idea of fully automated luxury communism. So I just would like to know what's your opinion on the fact that renewable energy and information want to be free. They overcome the principle of scarcity. So, um, and although the capitalist, the classical, neoclassical idea of scarcity cannot survive in an environment where inf information just multiplies and multiplies and renewable energy can be recycled over and over again, um, th this raises the question of ownership. So how do you answer this problem? So uh, I actually would not, not necessarily see my system as consistent with fully automated luxury communism. In fact, I would view it in many ways as the antithesis of that. And the reason I would say that is that um, that is based on a very centralized notion or one where everything is, as you sort of alluded to, infinitely sort of free and renewable and spills over to everyone. But I don't actually think that's how information works or even how renewable energy works. I think the reality is that there are economies of scale uh, in information, but they're not global or complete. We have different languages. We have different uh, gender identities. We have different races. We have different, uh, uh, we, we have all sorts of difference among us. And all of these things stand in the way of a uniform and homogenous view of, uh, uh, of identity. Or, or the spread of information. Because while it's true, you can, you can spread a piece of information infinitely, that information may not be meaningful or trusted to all, all people. And so we actually need plural sources of information. So I, I, my, my view actually is, is precisely not one where there's uh, just global abundance. Uh, it, it, nor is it one uh, based on the individual as isolated uh, in the capitalist model. Instead, it's based on the notion that diversity is what creates the possibility of individuality, that we're all inherently collective beings, but that in modernity, our collectivities are complex and multifaceted, which allows us the freedom to be ourselves and to be unique, and that it's that diversity and complexity that we need to uh, continue to grow, um, and that new technologies offer us ways to do that but not a way out 
um, to a world of sort of no constraints. Um, can you expound a bit on the idea that our gender identity or our, our class or our socio social identity somehow affects the flow of information? I'm not sure I grasped it entirely. Yeah, that's a great question. It? That's a great question. So what I mean is that, um, so yes, information can be, once produced, can be propagated quite cheaply. But what information is valued or needed by people? So one form of information might be, say, uh, uh, information about heterosexual uh, partners that are available in a city, like, you know, that, that um, uh, many of the dating apps allow. But another type of information is those that uh, homosexual partners. And as gender identity starts to become more complex, it becomes much richer than that, right? And so the relevant type of information is not homogeneous. It's as complex and fragmented as is our diversity. And every one of those types of ways in which we are not the same calls for different forms of collective organization to emerge. Uh, the information that's needed for me to worship uh, in the Jewish religion, as I do, is very different from how most Jews would worship. As I go to a God optional, uh, uh, artist driven, everyone inclusive synagogue, and other people would not find meaning in that context. Uh, and people in other religions would find meaning in other things. So our, our differences are a fundamental limit on the capacity to have global increasing returns. Um, and yet we also need systems that help us to cooperate across those differences uh, and to take advantage of the scale associated with those differences. So both the atomized individual notion and the global uh, you know, uh, state notion are kind of equally missing the way in which individuality is actually a byproduct of social complexity and vice versa. Thank you. Um, that's a lot of thought to think about. Thank you. Great answer. Thank you. Do we perhaps, Xenia? Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Your talk was super interesting. I have three main issues, three main questions. One is, how would a radical exchange work in terms of uh, the concept of big data? Uh, we somehow talk about that just uh, when you reply to the previous question. And then uh, a possible answer to a transnational answer, global answer to the climate breakdown. And then more sort of uh, uh, me trying to understand more about finance and quadratic finance. So there's this three things. Thank okay, you. great. So in terms of data, the way I think about it is that um, a fundamental problem is that our data, the, the, the dominant paradigms for thinking about our data are either in terms of like privacy or individual rights or individual property, or um, like, oh, data is just free flowing, the tech companies can use whatever they want, data should be open, whatever. Um, the problem with both of those is that they ignore the way in which data is collective but not global. So, for example, mm -hmm. my mother's date of birth is my mother's date of birth, and it's also my sister's mother's date of birth. And it's my uh, grandmother's date at which she had a, her first child, right? And so that, that information is neither global. It can't, it's not something that should be just available and free for anyone. But on the other hand, it's not individual either. It's not atomized individual either. It belongs to a group of people. Mm. Um, and all the other data that pertain to me are similar. The date, my, my first kiss was with someone else and that belongs to her as well as to me. Um, my uh, genetic information pertains to my family. So I think we need to build a both digital, like a, a technological, but also a social conception around data, which is based on the notion of intersecting communities that control information. That each datum is a community 
and that we lie at the intersection of those communities rather than separate with our data. Um, and yeah. But I mean, as you know, data are also the property of someone in terms of companies who use data and spread data in order for other companies to work with that. How would you reply to this? I mean, would you think that data should be used by everyone because a community in terms of whatever statistics and 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 control in the good the positive way of control would uh, you know like find data helpful a resource or yeah so i totally uh, i totally agree that um currently we have an architecture where data are controlled in sort of a centralized way by a small number of actors but i think there's an alternative that we can build through regulation and changes to the underlying digital architecture that keeps track of the communities that data belongs to and uses those communities as the loci for building services and bargaining uh, collectively so that we can achieve the scale benefits that the platforms get without mm. violating the essence of what's usually referred to as privacy, which is not actually privacy but the control by the relevant community of that data. And that's what the data collaboratives in Taiwan have started to show the way towards. And we can right. move both much further on both the technical front and on the legal front with legislation that we're working on with the European Union and with other jurisdictions that would empower these types of data cooperatives to bargain uh, uh, collectively. Um, in terms of the climate crisis, I think you know, a critical element of the climate crisis is A, um, achieving some agreements internationally mm -hmm. and B once those are done we need something like a carbon tax but it's not enough because we need the innovation to reorganize our lives to be consistent with uh, a low carbon world and capitalism can't do it on its own because it requires all sorts of public good in order to make it happen and uh, that's why we need something like quadratic funding to be paired with it and I'd actually like to really see a carbon tax fund, the matching fund for some, uh, uh, you know, quadratic finance system that helps us create the public goods that we need to adapt to a low carbon world. Um, in terms of quadratic funding, uh, yeah, so the, the key idea there is that either at present, either a philanthropist or a nation state or someone with some funds that they want to direct in something of a more democratic way can provide a matching fund and then the community can uh, uh, you know vote uh, effectively on how those matching funds are allocated according to this formula of the square of the sum of the square roots um, and that allows sort of for this mixture of the principle of expressing how important something is to you as a market does with money and the principle of um, democracy that more people matter more than fewer, but that, that's really just a start because eventually we need a way of representing social difference and, and the complexity that I was talking about and how what we really want to fund is not um, many people being involved in something, but many very different people being involved in it. Yeah, because there it seems that it will again be the problem of the state or a philanthropic figure to start yeah uh, right so absolutely we'll and, and go so back what, to the problem yeah we need we need taxes that are not like the ones that i described that are not necessarily coming from some centralized entity or their discretion but rather that come uh, out of actually removing the things that accumulate in uh, those profitable activities um, and eventually I'd like to have those built into social norms where that becomes enough of an expectation that it's not any central entity, but just sort of that, that's, that's what people expect. And, I, and my hope is that that grows out of a range of different types of communities from nation states to companies to nonprofits, uh, experimenting with these ideas and actually growing a new world that's more productive and more dynamic uh, out of it that, that supplants uh, the current nation state and capitalist architecture. I would see here a great place, a great room for law, 
because law is not necessarily connected with the state. The history of law is not the history of the state. They can yeah. be disconnected. And so this is the case of the antitrust law, for instance. But Absolutely. it should be driven internationally, globally. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Yeah, and, and so, I mean, that is the attraction, honestly, of um, neoliberalism and capitalism, I think, is that they have this abstract, commonsensical quality that transcends the need for hierarchical structures. But of course, they, they actually create hierarchical structures because of the flaws in their design. And what we need to do is to build a better system of, of imagination like that, that, that doesn't, uh, that, that leads to more emergent, uh, uh, diverse complexity rather than uh, to just sort of capitalism and you know, the profit mode of coordinating the control of uh, those, those processes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sanya, would you like to? Yes. Uh, thank you, Glenn, uh, very much. It was concise. And uh, uh, actually, we do have a lot of questions. And one of my questions are like uh, in your list of suggestions, uh, what we can and must do. I read um, sort of a metaphor because you, you spoke about uh, a social plasticity. So yeah. I'd like to, to hear more uh, how, if it's possible, yeah. uh, how is it possible to translate this uh, uh, metaphor uh, let's say, uh, for the, to start with, in an uh, open-ended uh, complex algorithm, how you are going to, to translate it into an algorithm. Yeah, absolutely. So we, we try to do that with a bunch of different algorithms. So one of them is quadratic funding. One of them is this salsa system of property. Another one is this idea of intersectional social data that I didn't get a chance to talk about, which is a data structure that can represent this notion of different data pertaining to multiple individuals and individuals pertaining to multiple data, um, sort of through a, a network. Another one is quadratic voting. Another one is um, this polis system of deliberation, but I'm sure there will be many more. So that the idea is not a single algorithm, um, but rather, a multiplicity of innovating and uh, you know evolving social algorithms in the same way that we've come you know no one expects technology to have some uh ultimate you know final single design the way that a lot of political philosophy conceptualizes the just society um and i think we need to learn to think about our social institutions in the same way you know, there's, there's some uh, economists, um, Drona Samoglu and James Robinson, who've said that like what you need to have a successful liberal democratic society is to stay on a very narrow path. I disagree. I think it's the opposite. I think that the only way forward is by imagining creative new things that help us resolve the, you know, lasting problems that we face. Uh, and we need a very broad uh, path of, of many different uh, experiments flourishing uh, that together weave together in ways that create complexity that we can't imagine, um, but based on relatively simple ideas that can be concisely communicated so that they're available to many people to make of what they want. Mm, great. Uh, that, that's actually a, a kind of a provocation because uh, social plasticity, well, <laughs> what is it? And when you put it in a concrete things, and uh, your, your uh, talk was about concrete elements, uh, what I was referring to is uh, the, the, uh, um, this noise that can be created between uh, the, me the metaphor and uh, the uh, application. What we need in our project, for example, and uh, we are, uh, hopefully we will solicit your, your help in, in this matter. Uh, yeah. Uh, we should uh, uh, now uh, let us go straight to the to the point. Uh, we should uh, imagine a model of uh, institutional um, uh, governance 
and uh, uh, the deliberative process of uh, specific uh, higher education uh, institution, which is a public university. And uh, that public university is uh, in a country uh, which, is, uh, which went through a, a, a hard transition, uh, hit now by all these economic uh, collapses and with, a, with an um, uh, GDP uh, depending uh, strongly on tourism. On, on service uh, uh, economies, et cetera, et cetera. Now I'm, now I'm just adding these elements that you need to, to collect for in order to, to build up the algorithm. But uh, so it's a weak state. It's a, it's, it's a state with a, uh, uh, basically uh, with a weak economy. Uh, and then you need to support uh, education. You need to build up a, a strong, uh, uh, basis uh, for for future uh, uh, we imagine it as a, as a future uh, society. Uh, yeah, so I, 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 I absolutely agree. Yeah. What, what we need is this combination of the practice, yeah, which is somewhat vague and you know social plasticity and whatever, but it has to be a practice of creating concrete objects. Mm -hmm that can be communicated broadly, not just to the people who are capable of engaging in this vaguer conversation, so that they can make of it what they want. Mm -hmm. So you need a, a, a cultural practice of creating tangible objects um, that can be easily transmitted. Um, and, and you need both of those things at the same time. That's why Radical Exchange puts equal emphasis on the arts, on academics, on entrepreneurship, and on activism, because we believe that all those elements need to fuse together. And you know, to take the example of the university, one thing that we're working on is a new way of imagining sort of academic publishing and you know, academic credit and tenure review that's based on the notion of partial common ownership as, as our property model is, where rather than having the just authors of a piece, you would sort of have open list of signatories to that piece. Um, and the authors and maybe the editor and referee get the first chance to sign, but other people can openly sign below it. And so that you blur the boundaries between a, a you know, author and someone who discovers something early and is a supporter and a political supporter of the ideas embedded in the thing. Mm -hmm. and, and those all become a continuum. Mm -hmm. um, and then you can potentially use that signatory structure as a way if you're trying to review someone's like tenure case or whatever, to think about, uh, no, I don't just want to know if it's published in this journal, but who was it that signed on to it? You know, who supports the age? So the, these are the types of, um, these are some of the types of uh, approaches. Someone asked about the papers and, and stuff around radical exchange. They're, they're, my research page is available, but I would also just recommend on the radical exchange website, there's a nice curation of resources that that I'd, that I'd recommend checking out. Thanks. Okay, if we don't have any more questions, I think that, uh, thank you very much, Glenn, for giving us this talk and uh, discussing with us these uh, subjects and we are looking forward to uh, collaborating with Radical Exchange on this project. I see that Jen is also here in the audience. Yeah, I was really so, glad to see Jen here too. <laughs> yes, so uh, thank you very much and uh, we'll be sort of, we're really looking forward to the cooperation with Radical Exchange and to try to use the concepts and investigate new concepts perhaps and so absolutely forth. yeah thank looking forward to it thanks for having me take care thank you we, we want to invite you to croatia because mm -hmm. uh, we are having a beautiful beautiful uh, uh island called tres and we have a moise palace mm -hmm. uh it's a renaissance palace uh in the middle of the tiny uh, uh, uh 
Tres uh, city, it's a Renaissance uh, size city as well. So uh, we, you need to come with your team and- Yeah, work. that sounds lovely. I look forward to it. I, uh, you know, we're, we're working with the government of Latvia. We're working hopefully with Estonia. So hopefully uh, this will be um, one of uh, many stops in Eastern Europe, so. Marco Luca will share with you the, the link so that you can see the, the, the uh, the venue and uh, I'm certain that you will love it so uh, uh, <laughs> wonderful thank you, thank you so, so much thank you very much bye bye good rest of the day bye goodbye